everybody, welcome to the Catholic Influencer Podcast. A conversation to help Catholic influencers like you and me go deeper and further in influencing our world for Jesus. I'm your host, Father Rob Gallia. And I'm your co-host, Danny Sullivan. And today we're going to talk to you about addiction. It's a beautiful rainy day, Danny, today. It is the best, but I bought some really pretty new shoes <laughs> yesterday, so I couldn't wear them today in case they got wet. Oh my goodness. Why are they suede? No, they're leather. Um, and I saved up for them and I got them and now I'm too scared to wear them. <laughs> so not the greatest purchase, but they're very pretty to look at. Well, I got a new pair of shoes yesterday, which you don't like. I they you took them out of the box, they came into the office, and me and Janine both were like, oh. <laughs> well, I got them for, for free, so I'm happy with them. Yeah. And they, um, I didn't wear them for the same reason today. <laughs> I would have. They're bright red, yeah. bright red shoes, cardinal hey, shoes. This is like the first time it's rained here for a very long time. So like yeah. everyone's very excited. And then I'm here going, oh, my shoes. Yes. But it is very exciting to have rain. We need it desperately. And absolutely. And I did notice as well something tragic, something crazy, that the, um, the roof in my bathroom is leaking. <gasps> so throughout the whole night, I was hearing the shower, keeping thinking that the shower was on, but it leaked over the shower. Anyway. My the- hallway was leaking too. Oh. But a month ago, the leak was repaired. So I think maybe they didn't do a proper job. Oh now I have to call goodness. my landlord again. Such, you see, rain is a blessing, but also can yeah. can bring out the problems eh, in our lives. The little problems in our <laughs> lives. <laughs> so today we're talking about other uh, another issue um, which affects so many people. Um, and this is the um, issue of, of addiction. Now addiction, we can point and look out and think, hey, um, so so people who are on drugs, things like that. Is, but addiction takes so many forms and we often don't realize that it is... Um, it affects so, so many people. And one of the things that it does is that it takes away our freedom and uh, 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 the beautiful freedom which Jesus has given us. Absolutely. And in Galatians 5 verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Absolutely. Yes. Jesus came into this world to give us freedom. And there are so many things that steal away our freedom. And addiction is exactly that. It starts slow. It starts usually out of curiosity, out of belief that we are going to be happier on the other side after we take this, after we do this. But at the end of the day, it takes away our freedom. It takes away the joy of, of, of being in right relationship with God. And so um, I, I, I'm, as a teenager, I struggled with, with addiction for a long time. And I know, I really know how horrible it is to, to look back and think you're in control. And then looking back and think, oh my goodness, I'm no longer in control. And this thing that is controlling my life is destroying my life. And I think like addiction can be so broad. It's not just the drugs and alcohol, which is kind Mm. of what people assume first, I guess. That's the one that is given light to. But there's so many other types. It can be physical and psychological. And then it just, you know, it leads to the point where it can be harmful to the individual and their relationships as well. Absolutely true. And so um, just to list a few things that we could be addicted to, there's gambling, there's drugs, alcohol, nicotine, work, shopping, pornography, even our computers and our phones, um, stealing, sex, self-harm, so many things that can take away the freedom that Christ um, Christ has given us. Let's ask the question, why? Why do addictions be- begin? And I think one of the things is that we may want to feel different. We may um, use substances, um, um, sex or even gambling and want to get that enjoyable feeling again, sometimes because we feel dark, sometimes because we don't feel loved enough, sometimes we don't feel strong enough, sometimes we want to punish ourselves or even um, award ourselves by um, a, a good feeling by or thinking that this thing is going to take away our mind, our mind. Uh, our pain at that moment. Yeah. And as you've come to rely on these things, not having them, that means that you have to face your own pain and you have to face that in yourself and admit it as well. But that's facing the cross. That's facing the pain in your life. And then having to come to terms with that is really difficult. Yes. As you're saying, you know, it's really hard to face the emptiness. It's really hard to face the cross. It's fa- it's hard to, to stop and even face yourself, especially if you're going through pain and suffering. 
Yeah. And facing it, like it is a difficult journey, but then there's also the other things that it affects in your life. It's going to, you know, it can affect your work performance, your relationships, your family relationships, friends, all these things. Like it's bigger than just you and whatever it is that is being used to kind of mask that pain or that hurt or whatever it is that they're relying on. It is so much bigger than that. It goes out to the community as well. So it is such a big issue like it's it's gonna be really hard to talk about in 10 15 minutes but the the, the fact of, of addiction is it affects more than ourselves it affects mm. our families it affects the people it affects our time it affects those around us and so i'm um, just uh, maybe you um, don't know if you're addicted to something i just was looking through this um, website health direct um and th- this website i just i was trying to study of ways in in which we can discover whether we have an addiction and th- they come up with five points here. The first thing is, is they say here, the symptoms of addiction is first of all, repeating something, even though it interferes with your life, that you keep doing something and some almost planning for the next hit. So even throughout your day, you're thinking about the next time you're going to do something else. And as you were saying just before, it really does affect your whole life. And as the addiction gets worse, it, worse, it starts to take over your life. It's a, every thought. Um, it affects your work. It affects your relationships. It affects everything. But it starts. It starts. It can start small, but by simply repeating something and expecting for um, us to be and to, expecting to be happy expecting to be free at the end of it. The second thing is that when the addiction starts to get worse, you start losing interest in other things. And all you think about and all you dream about is this next high, this next time you're going to do this, this thing that you're addicted to. And third thing is being angry and sad and depressed or even violent and moody, especially at times after the hit or just when you haven't had something for, for a long time. And as I say, when I say the hit, I'm not talking about um, drugs necessarily. It could be even pornography. It could be um, self-harm. It could be lying. It could be so many things. The fourth thing is that you start to notice a change in eating habits as well, um, even sleep. Sleeping and even in your weight, whether um, you stop eating or, or you lose your appetite, especially at moments when you're looking for the next high. And then the fifth thing is that feeling sick and shaky or even compelled where you've reached a point where you see red. You want nothing but to do this thing. And that's as almost, that not almost, that is a loss of self-control where you're like a bull, you're charging towards the red cloth and there's nothing that's going to stop you. And that is a moment as well where you notice your freedom is gone. Your freedom is gone. You're controlled by this next hit. Um, even when you're trying to, to, trying to quit. So I think it's important if you do notice that you do have an addiction, it's so important as well to seek help. And there are many places we can seek help. Um, in Australia, we have something called Lifeline as well, and Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's reachout.com, and speaking out to family and friends, making sure that we're not doing this alone, because we, we cannot, we cannot overcome addiction alone. There's professional help we can get, and there's also um, help, the support we need of family and friends, those around us. Yeah, that's really good, like, I guess, practical what what we can do to recognize um, addiction in our own lives and then where to go for help. But we started with Galatians and that says that Christ wants us to be free and he doesn't want us to be burdened by slavery in this, you know, in this case, slavery to addiction. So what are things Christians can do to Absolutely. overcome addiction? And this is, I think, one of the things that we can't sell Jesus short, okay? I think one of the things we need to understand is that Jesus is there with us, whether we're addicted, whether we're free. Christ doesn't walk away from us when we're addicted. He's, he walks with us through the whole thing. And so I think having faith, Faith, having a relationship with God, having a, a relationship with Jesus puts you at an advantage, um, puts you at an advantage to, to be able to overcome um, your addiction. And again, I just want to go through four points of how we can overcome our addiction. You're loving the list today. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the list today. But I think it, it, one of the things that, especially when going through addiction, is that we need to be practical. Mm-hmm. We need to find ways. I think so, number one, as a Christian, I think the first thing that we need to do is to 
confront our denial. Okay, we need to speak out. We need to bring it to the light. You know, when we bring things into the light, the devil has less of a power, less of a hold. It's like having, you know, worms and having insects underneath a rock. The minute you lift up the rock and you bring it into the light, what happens is that the the insects start to disperse. They start to move away from from that that previously dark place. And this is what Jesus does in our life. He lifts up the rocks in our lives and we need to bring it to the light. It's up to us to speak out about it. The second thing is to understand the, the nature of the battle, that it is a spiritual war. It is a physical war, but the devil wants your soul. He wants to destroy you. He wants to uh, eliminate you, wants to take away your joy. And you need to know that this is not only a physical problem, but it is a spiritual problem too. This is why you need to pray. This is why you need spiritual warfare. This is why you need people to pray with you and that it, it, to, to recondition you, to help you to love Jesus and to trust Jesus with this spiritual problem. It's not everything. You see, I used to love Bishop Joe, um, who was the previous bishop of this place, used to say this, used to say, prayer isn't everything, but it is the first thing. And so we need to start off w- w- with prayer. And then the third thing, maybe then you can you can help us um, understand what the third thing in the in the list is. The third thing is getting psychological help. So prayer isn't everything, but it is the first thing. But then we also need help from people that are professionals in this. So go out and seek out help of why and how you feel this way and react this way and how to overcome it as well. Exactly. So the way we act and react in certain ways is it doesn't come out of uh, out of nothing. You know, I act and react in certain ways and I have addiction and I turn to these things because of other things that have led me there. So the professional help, the psychologists and the psychiatrists, the counselors, the shrinks, call them whatever you want. These are people that can help us understand ourselves so that we can deal with the way we behave and, and be able to overcome things like that. Do you want to go back to the fourth one, Father Rob? Okay, so the fourth thing is um, to practice preventative accountability. And so what I'm saying is as as Christians, as particularly as Catholics, we can so easily um, alleviate our guilt by going to confession. Now, confession is so important and I cannot recommend it enough. We need to go to confession because the addictions sometimes lead us to sin and, and they are sinful. So it is important to go to confession. But again, confession is not enough. It is not enough. Don't go into confession, confess your sins and think the problem is solved. It is not solved. We need accountability. We need spiritual direction. We need people to walk with us. And if we have done wrong as well, it's so important for us to work on retribution. For example, if our addiction is to stealing, we have to work hard on making sure we return the things that we have stolen. Going to confession and and confessing our sins and feeling good about it at the end is not enough. We need to make sure we work on on our spirituality. We make sure we work on becoming better people and, and fighting this addiction. And one of the things, again, we need to understand that Jesus walks with us, but we need to take this step. We need to make the effort. We need to get up and walk to Towards the cross, not once, not twice, not ten times a day, but a thousand times a day. We're going to fall, but we can get back up and walk. And as Christians, as faith-filled people, we are not exempt from these things. We're not exempt from addiction. We're not exempt from uh, from things that cause us to fall. But one thing that we do know is that we can get up and walk back to the cross. We can walk back to the community that can help us and carry us towards the cross. Absolutely. And a community that does this here in Bendigo is this therapeutic community called Impact Recovery. So we're going to go into an interview now with Richard, who volunteers here. He's volunteered for the past seven years. So helping people, um, I guess, come to terms with what it is that they're addicted to and then overcoming that in a 12-month program with other people going through so many different addictions and how their lives and the lives of the people that they love and are in relationship with are transformed through this recovery program. today with Richard Gibbs. Richard, you work at Impact Recovery. It is a local rehabilitation center in here in Bendigo. Do you just want to introduce yourself and maybe a bit about the work that you do there? Yeah, so I work with Impact Recovery as a volunteer. I've been involved in it from its start. It used to be Transformations, but now it's Impact Recovery. I've worked in it for seven years, as I said. It's a therapeutic community 
that helps people with um, life addictions and things that in their life aren't really helpful. Excellent. And that's really incredible work that you're doing there. I just wonder if you want to tell us a little bit about addictions. I don't know, maybe how they start and through your seven years at this particular place as well, a little bit about what you've witnessed. Yeah, look, what we do there is we just, it's sort of boot camp for life. It's a therapeutic community. And what happens there is that people come and live in and it's um, a program which runs over 12 months if people want to spend 12 months, but it runs in four brackets of three months and it's different graduations at each stage and then people just deal with those life issues that have brought them to that place in a safe environment. So we just provide a platform and the therapeutic community actually works with it so that people work with each other to try and um, sort out what's going on in their lives. It's just a real thrill to watch people come out of bondage and into a space where they've got life and freedom and they've got a purpose. And that's mostly what this program's all about, to actually let people have the space to find out who they actually are and to enjoy the person that they're really meant to be and not the person that they've become. From what I've seen, it's a really, it's a tough journey but it's a really exciting journey. Um, it's a journey of re- discovery for them. And um, finding out who they are is just really releasing. You see people come in looking defeated, living in a veneer of life, just closed in tight, no space. And then all of a sudden you see them as they get a bit of revelation and it starts to work for them. You can see them actually um, grow. The lights come on and their eyes start to come alive and their heads start to come up and the hoodie comes off. So they're really good signs in this process. That's beautiful. And that's, you know, being able to witness firsthand that transformation in someone's life, I imagine, you know, would also impact yourself. Yeah, it really does. Because, you know, we have gatherings and we go out and do day trips with these um, guys and girls. And and I often find myself looking around and thinking, yep, 10% of these people would be dead if they weren't here. And that's the reality but you see them actually enjoying life and doing stuff that everybody else does in a way and just being thrilled as they um, do it. And you can see the excitement of becoming what they call, this is what normal people do, isn't it? Yeah, so that's, that's really, really um, encouraging and rewarding to be able to be part of that and to witness that. Absolutely. What a, what a privilege to be able to witness that firsthand. Like what you do is incredible work. I guess a little bit about what you've witnessed throughout your time Addiction in itself takes on many forms. So the, the ones that we notice and we call addiction and that are sort of in the press all the time are so things like gambling, drugs, alcohol, nicotine. But there are a lot of other addictions as well. For example, pornography, um, religion, sex, um, other things which probably we don't realise as, as an addiction is work, um, food, social media. So they're all, all something that medicates or fills a gap in someone's life to actually hide something that's gone on in the past. So they're usually fine with people who are in addiction. They're medicating some pain that's happened to them the previous time and they're just trying to hide or escape it in some other way by filling in the gaps with these other things. The basis of the addiction is that Most people have come across some pain early in their lives and it creates a rejection for them and so they don't feel as though they belong anywhere and they're just lost and they've lost who they are and they've lost the purpose of life and they've lost the will to actually um, try to keep going. Yeah. So, Richard, do you notice any patterns maybe of the socioeconomic levels, the education levels of people that come into this program or people struggling with addictions? Um, no, there are no general rules with it. Um, in my experience, I've noticed that there are it's male and female, it's old and young. Like we've got our first graduate was a 21-year-old and we've had a 55-year-old graduate and we've had people from wealthy families, we've had people who have been wealthy themselves, we've had people from really poor socioeconomic environments. I think it's probably harder for wealthy people to get better mm-hmm. because... Um, they are able to, they're in a position where they can hide the addiction and they've got more resources to actually feed the habit and so they don't have to go and do the crime and steal the cars and um, a lot of the girls going to prostitution. They don't have to do that sort of thing because they can actually support their habit and they can actually hide it a lot better behind the money. 
And um, yeah, so it's so that can be pretty tough. But you, there are certain addictions too that you can hide, like a heroin addict can um, hide that. They can become high functioning, and they can, if they can support the habit, they don't look um, like the typical addict that we think we see in the street. They can look like a man who turns up in a, or a woman who turns up in a suit to work and um, just carries on normally. But there are people who can who can do that sort of thing. So you can hide that. You can hide an addiction to work because actually what happens there is that society applauds that. They say, wow, that person is um, doing a really good job. Look how hard they work. But behind that could be an addiction to work, which is still based in some sort of um, trying to get some self-worth. But it's very hard to hide an ice addiction. You sort of can't really function and it takes a lot of support and you can't do that. So, um, yeah, it. I don't think it affects any one socioeconomic place, but I think it can be easily hidden if you've got lots of um, resource to actually get your um, your fix and then you can hide it a whole lot better. Personally, I've never thought of that, you know, that how much easier it must be for those that can't afford to hide it to hide it. In the news particularly, it's when there's thefts or robberies and then if it is linked with an addiction, it's kind of easy to be like, oh, you know, they're a bit down and out. They obviously needed to do that to get their fix. But, yeah, if you're yeah. well off, then... You know, you can hide one half of it. And yeah. The media doesn't seem to latch onto that as easily. Not at all. Yeah, we see that on the media and we all, all of a sudden we make an assumption, okay, so it's the down and outers that are really doing this and uh, nobody else. But, yeah, they're just desperate for a fix, so they'll do anything for it, whereas the um, people who are well-resourced, they just can get it when they want it and as they need it. Yeah, but still keep need hiding. Yeah, as much help as everyone else <laughs> exactly. to overcome this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I guess, you know, this impact recovery here in Bendigo, it is – a Christian transformation center at its yep. core. And I guess what what part does faith play in that journey of someone that's overcoming addiction? Faith's a really, really big part of it. I, th- I think people can get well themselves, um, but they reach a ceiling and they can only get a certain way on the, play, in the, on the way to being well-being. But with faith, that is that just opens up anything and everything to an infinite potential for people. So they don't hit that roof and stay there and hang on by their fingernails. They've got the faith resource and then extends and expands the space that they then live in and it becomes just an open plate for them to experience anything they want to and anything they really do. And they, that's when they start finding what their real gifting is in life, their real purpose in life and... Um, the search actually finishes and they actually know who they are and what they're here for and then the adventure of actually living in that newfound space Mm. really begins and and that's when you find people are really been able to beat this addiction thing that's been controlling their life for a long time. So they, they say that people have got three basic needs in life. The first need is to be loved and accepted The second need is to know that you have worth. And the third need is to know that we're not alone. And the opposites of them are rejection, unworthiness or worthless and lonely. So they're the three basic needs. And so that's what they're looking for. They're looking for love. They're looking for a sense of value. And they're looking for a um, a place and a sense of belonging. If you go back about 2,000 years, and you look in um, at the baptism of Jesus, when John the Baptist baptised Jesus, God the Father turned up and he said, this is my son whom I love and am well pleased. So you've got those three basic needs right there in that one statement. This is my son, he belongs, he's mine. Who I love, he's loved and am well pleased, he's got worth. I find worth in him. So it's that sort of discovery, people with faith, that they actually, that's what they want in life. And through people around them and through a relationship with God, that's when they get their real value and they have all those three things met. Once they're met, then people are well on the way to recovery. They're really doing a good job to um, yeah, get to that place. And that's so nice to see that even scripture um, has that promise to us. Yeah. That, you know, we belong, we are loved, and we have worth. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're just discovering that in the um, reality of life these days. But mm. God 
he put it there right from the start, and that was exactly the way he explained it when he um, made that declaration about Jesus at his baptism. I just love that. Absolutely. I love it. That's really beautiful to bring that out of this conversation. So I guess going forward to that and looking at the faith in addiction, you know, we've mentioned that this Impact Recovery is a Christian organisation, you know, for transformation in people's lives. Should churches have a ministry for those struggling with addiction or what can we do to help people with addiction overcome this? I think we do have a role as a church. Um, Impact Recovery has Christian values in it and we present faith to people but we don't expect them or force them to accept it. If it comes up, we just encourage them to look at it and to contemplate it. And many people do embrace it, but there are others who go through the program and don't embrace it and still do well. So the role of the church, I think, um, is really important here because I think there's a fair bit of ignorance around addiction and what actually causes it. So if the church could be understand what causes addiction, it's mostly based in some sort of pain somewhere and they're just trying to find some medication, some relief to hide from that pain. Um, and I think the church has a, has a real role in that. If you look at the example of Lazarus, he was dead and then Jesus came along and he says, come out. So it's only Jesus that can give life. But then he handed over the situation then to the people around him and said, unwrap him. And I think that could, that's a real good example of what the church's role is. So Jesus gives the life, then we partner with him as the bondage and the transformation happens with the people and be that very slowly. Like I imagine they didn't unwrap Lazarus too quickly because there was nothing underneath Mm. and they didn't want to embarrass him or harm him in any way. So there would have been some real protection there for him as he was unraveled and unwrapped from those grave clothes. But nevertheless, it was the people around that had the task and the privilege of doing that. And I think that's what the church is. We've got to recognise that God gives a life. God's the healer. We can have a hand in that in helping people to get released. Beautiful. And I like that, that it is Jesus that heals. It's him that brings life. But then it's the church where his hands and feet here on earth and we need to help him in that ministry as well. Yeah. What a privilege that is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Such a privilege to be able to walk so closely with someone that is vulnerable and is needing support and love. Yeah, it is. And um it's an amazing thing to be part of that and to experience that. It's, it's sensational. Mm. Love it. So I guess that's um, how we as a church can help those struggling with addiction. But for people that are going through addiction now, what are some practical tips, you know, through your experience that you can give them in what they can do to overcome this? Okay, so the first thing is that you, people need to realise that they need help. If you don't need help, then you won't get help. And it's no good sort of going and seeking help if you feel like you have to because your spouse or your kids or your friends say, hey, you need help, well, I better go and do something. That just doesn't work. You've got to realise it yourself, hey, I've got a problem and I need help and I'm going to seek it out. You'll probably find that it's very difficult to do on their own, very, very difficult because the first thing they realise is I need help and they can't help themselves, so they've already admitted that this is a tough course and I want to do something about it. So then just seek out advice. Seek out people who know a bit about this um, process. You might find that you want to go into a rehab. You might want to go into a therapeutic community. You might want to detox. You might just want to get family around you. But the best way to do it is to be honest about where you are and be honest about your pain and then to deal with that and to... um, Stop telling lies because most people who are really serious addicts are really good con men as well. (laughs) They'll admit that. They said, we, I had one guy in the program who said, um, I said to him, you, um, you're a pretty good liar, aren't you? You're pretty, no, I said, you're pretty good at telling lies, aren't you? He said, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I am pretty good at it. He said, in fact, I'm, I'm very good at it. And he said, actually, I'm exceptional at it. He said, I'm the best. (laughs) So he he knew it and he was going to admit it and that was one of the things that he wanted to to come through with. Yeah, there's lots of stories about the the lights coming on with people in this program that Mm. you just think, yeah, okay, that's a big step forward. They're really... um, they're really onto something here. They're on the road to recovery when they um, when they come up with that stuff. So yeah, yeah you've got to realise you want to do help, then chase it out, and that can be in many many forms. The best way is to have a concentrated period of time where you can actually sit, reflect, get the help you need to deal with the stuff that you're dealing with, 
without the assistance of the um, of the things that you've been used to um, using to hide the pain. Absolutely, that's really good um, practical advice there. You know of what you can do if if you are able to recognise there's an addiction in your life that you do need to overcome to be free. What are some of the benefits you notice with the graduates that come out of the program? Okay, so the, there are lots and lots of benefits for the person themselves. They um, they're able to get a job. Um, they're able to get housing. Um, they've got restored relationships with family and um, friends. Like a couple of examples, just recently, as um, one of our graduates, he was um, reunited with his wife and two kids. They're just so excited to have their their dad back. We had one guy in who um, was reunited with a son he'd never met after 27 years. So he knew he had a son, but he'd never met him. And he's actually gone and met him. And also brothers and sisters coming back in because addiction drives people away. They get, um, they throw their arms in the air, family around them and say, look, this is just too hard. It's easy for me to, it's easier for me to leave these people alone. I can't, the pain is too much. I can't do this anymore. And to see the people and family around them coming back into their lives and the relationships restored is um, just amazing. And the other thing, the other benefit is that in some cases this has been a generational thing. So mum and dad are addicts and then grandma and granddad were addicts and then it just goes back. But the, the people who then come out of the program and are living a life without addiction, they're actually generational changes. So the generations from then on aren't involved or don't need that addiction because they've learned a new way of managing life and they can pass that on to their kids and their kids will pass that on to their kids. So it really is a generational thing. It's wonderful to watch that. That's beautiful to know that um, it can reach so much wider than just a person struggling with the addiction and out to their families and that's when they're in the addiction but then when they overcome it as well. So really beautiful transformation there in so many lives and the community as well. Yeah, it's got massive knock-on effects all over the place. Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, it's, it's a treasure. Thank you so much today, Richard, for coming in and having this conversation. It's been such an eye-opening experience for me as well, and I hope the listeners to learn a little bit more about addiction, you know, where it comes from, and then the overcoming it as well and that need for love, worth, and belonging in our lives. So thank you very much. We'll be praying for impact recovery, um, everyone in the program, everyone that's still to go through or has gone through the program as well, and all of you volunteering and working there as well. That's great. Can I put in one plug? Please. A couple of phone call, phone numbers? Yeah, absolutely. Is that all right? <laughs> of course. So the Impact Mobile number is 0466 047 That's 0466 Our intake officer, Bryce, who's a graduate of the program, awesome guy, really compassionate. Uh, his number is 0447 002 that's zero four four seven zero zero two six six eight, and his name is Bryce. Excellent. And just a little note: they are Australian mobile numbers, so be careful if you're calling them from everywhere around the world. Um, and it's for a Bendigo centre as well. Yeah, but we take people from anywhere. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much today for coming in, Richard. Pleasure. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Catholic Influencers Podcast. We love hearing from you, so please get in touch at frgministry.com forward slash podcast or any of our social medias, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at FRG Ministry. Until next time, God bless.